Hello and welcome to the Healthy Work and Workplaces podcast hosted by the Healthy Work Research Unit at Aston University. I'm your host and head of the research unit, Dr. Simon McCabe. Today's guest is Dr. Emma Bridger. Dr. Bridger works as a lecturer in the psychology department of the University of Leicester. We're delighted to have her with us today to talk about her pathway into health research and her current work. Emma, welcome. Thank you very much, Simon. Lovely to be here. So before we jump into uh, the meat of things, uh, I'd like to just introduce our guests and talk a little bit about their background. So could you tell me a bit about yourself? Um, what is your background? What got you into the field? And kind of how did you end up where you are now? It's a good question. My answer to that is a bit of a windy road. I did a PhD in cognitive neuroscience. If you look at my publication list, it's actually pretty electrophysiology heavy and very lab-based stuff. I worked in that for my PhD and a postdoc in Germany for many years. And when well, many years, about nine years in total. And after a while, I knew I wanted to return to the UK. And I knew I also wanted to do more work that I thought was more related to applied context, particularly health, uh, outside the lab, basically, and social justice type issues I was really interested in. So I actually went to Sterling to do a master's in behavioral science, and which had, had, had at the time a very strong emphasis on well-being research. And I learned a lot there about different ways to think about measuring, studying, and thinking about policy as well a lot. And uh, on the back, back of that, um, I changed my research direction quite completely and started focusing a lot more on, on how we can use different behavioral science approaches to ask and answer questions about inequality in health in particular. I'm particularly interested in socioeconomic health inequality and how we can measure it and how people make sense of it. So I've been thinking about those kind of questions now for about seven years or so. Um, I moved to University of Leicester this year, but before that I was working just down the road at Birmingham City University as a research fellow where um, I was doing a lot of answering those kind of questions. Um, but now I'm in the health and well-being group at, at the University of Leicester in the psychology department and again using quite different approaches to be thinking about health, um, some of them more social epidemiology and some more classic what I would call social psychology which I think intersects with your own approaches as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's a couple of questions I want to ask here. So the first is we have lots of PhD students uh, and people who are planning to do masters and um, PhDs uh, in the future. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in, in Germany and how that um, might have differed from your experiences with the UK programs that you took in the, the MSc in Sterling, for example? Yeah, sure. So when I was working in Germany, I started off actually in what was called the graduate college. So my job was, I was one of two postdocs who were kind of the support system support buffer zone if you will between the senior staff and the PhDs and there was quite a lot of them at quite a large cohort at the same time and it was a real privilege to be to be in that position um to kind of support them because of a lot of them they had each other as well but it was it was actually quite a competitive environment I, I sensed them um, the they did there was a lot the culture was definitely um encouraged people to compare themselves to each other and how well they were doing, um, which was slightly different to what I was used to in the UK. But again, time, that was well over 10 years ago. Things I think all cultures are, are changing. Um, so at the time, obviously, it was a privilege to be in that position. Um, and then I stayed on and did um, more research and, and lecturing there. How does it relate to and when I was in the master's? At, at, um, it was quite unusual for me because I not many people do a PhD and then do a master's. I, I kind of got it back to front. So that was, I had a, again, privileged position there and that I was an experienced researcher and I didn't necessarily need to know as much about or learn as much about some of the fundamentals of research as other other colleagues. Um, is it, is your question about kind of advice or differences in different, would I recommend to people? Um, I suppose you could take that stance on it. Um, simply trying to understand how PhDs and that that kind of level of training works in the UK versus other um, places is something that we like to talk about. So we spoke previously about the difference between like a PhD and a, a DBA. Um, so yeah, just like these PhD um, training programs come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and flavors. Um, and so just trying to understand really what mm -hmm. they look like in different places because I, I don't know. Hmm. I think the mo the model that we had there was much more similar to the doctoral programs uh, that you get now, which is not how it was when I did my PhD as well. So I kind of went from a, a kind of lab-based system 
where I was at Cardiff um, and we were a, a small, very tightly knit group of PhDs doing very similar, very, very similar things. And then we moved to this, then I moved to, to Germany where people were, there were lots of labs together. And so there was m more of a community, but also more comp competition, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So you've, uh, if I've understood you correctly, you've sort of gone from <clears throat> the area of you like neuropsychology uh, into behavioral science uh, and then back into psychology in particular, this, mm -hmm. this um, health slant. Um, just for the benefit of the listeners, can you explain a little bit how behavioral science differs from psychology? Oh, that is a very, and I think I'm a bit sloppy in my usage of behavioral science. For me, I, I use the term behavioral science as more broader including psychology and other affiliated disciplines like behavioral economics and e economic approaches to, to making sense of behavior, um, as well as more uh, epidemiological work or what I might, some people might see as more sociological work using large data sets of about uh, more representative populations or, or samples than we, we have historically used in psychology. So it's a it's a larger gamut of of approaches. It expands from lab work to um, outside lab work, field experiments. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's basically more broader approaches mm -hmm. that you can use to to kind of triangulate certain questions. I think is my take. Would you think it's fair to say that behavioral science also tends to have more of an applied or policy focused flavor to it? Yeah, that, I mean that's been my take. That's the way I've come at it as well. I think psychology, psychology as I was taught it and as I now teach it today, I suppose is often more basic in a sense that it's or fundamental. Basic, I don't really like as a term. I think it means different things to different people. But yeah, more theoretical it can be. Whereas behavioral sciences is, is more in how can we change things often. Excellent. And so I think there's a, a real strand here from that behavioral science training that you took to where you are now uh, and this this interest in policy and applied work mm -hmm. and, and making a change. So can you talk a little bit about or give us an example of projects or problems you've been working on recently and kind of why you think it's important or interesting? Sure. I, I think with a caveat, I haven't figured it all out yet. Um, it's more of a journey, a kind of direction of travel. I think one of, one of the things I'm most interested in is how psychology can contribute to thinking about population or public health type level problems. And I think one of the ways I think can be helpful to make sense of what I mean by that is to think about the metaphor we often see in population or public health, the kind of upstream downstream metaphor, which you've probably come across the idea that when we see issues in society, they might be health-based, they don't have to be. The kind of me the metaphor of the river is that we see people in the river, we want to pull them out, but it also makes sense to figure out why so many people are in the river in the first place and to go upstream to figure out what those problems are and prevent them at that point as well. So preventative policy is what I'm particularly interested in, in the sense that it's very intuitive, everybody's on board with it in principle, but it's very difficult to actually implement it. And what you often see in public health spaces is the phenomenon that's referred to as lifestyle drift, so the idea that even with the best of intentions, interventions often drift down to the behavioral or the lifestyle choice type level, which is what we psychologists really thrive in. That's our kind of zone, our area of interest, of where we can make the most immediate or intuitive interventions. But it's it's not all we should be doing, I think. And I'm interested in whether psychology can help push the focus back upstream as well. And whether public health specialists see any value in that, which is one of the things that I think I struggle with a bit, is, is kind of talking across disciplines. Um, and and whether social cognition in particular can help make sense of it. So some people people are looking at this in social policy. I think it's, um, you may have come across the work of Paul Kearney, who, who's at Sterling, social policy professor. And he he's written a whole book on why preventative policy is so difficult to implement. And his psychological input on that is that it comes back to the key principles of bounded rationality, that we only have kind of finite co cognitive capacities to some extent, and many, of many, if not all, policy areas are very complex. And so preventative policy sounds great, but it's a very superficial term and it doesn't take long to, to figure out that it's really, really difficult to do. 
And I think the band of rationality explanation is a really important one, but I'm interested in whether there's other things that we can bring as social psychologists to making sense of it, and particularly about conceptualizing structural or these more difficult upstream determinants which come to impact on health. And I'm particularly interested in the, those social determinants of health. I could give you an example of some work we've done. Um, it's much more about perceptions of, of those inequalities, um, wh what I would call socioeconomic health inequalities. So the fact that we know there are these, these large disparities in people's health, longevity, mor morbidity, by pretty much any metric you use in terms of socioeconomic conditions. So the question, one of the questions we've been asking is how well does just Joe Public know that? And how does that relate then? So social psychology has been doing a lot of work on economic inequality because what, how well people represent or understand economic inequality predicts whether they support policies to address it. Um, and we, we were interested in whether that's the same for health disparities, the fact that people who are rich tend to live longer than others. And so some of the work we've been doing is, is d literally pitting those kind of distributional preferences against each other and finding that people more accept that the rich should earn more than, than the poor, using these terms very loosely, but they don't accept that they should live longer. But then when you look at the causal explanations that people use to, to say, why do the rich live longer? People who say it's because of uh, person level factors like self-control or effort or ability tend to think that the rich should live longer. So what we see, and those are kind of classic attributional biases we know from social psychology, what we might call deservingness heuristics, and they play out as well for health inequalities as well. So some of the similar mechanisms are underpinning that. And it's quite interesting because I think in health work, there's often an implicit assumption that there's something particularly special about health. And I, I actually also think that, I think, that, that health matters. And we need, that's why we study it so much, because it's it's key to our sense of worth, our well-being. You can't realize any other aspect of your life if you're not alive or healthy. And so that's why it's particularly special. And that's why I'm interested in why psychologists haven't looked at it as much. And then when we find, when you look at it, it shows similar patterns to, to economic inequality in terms of how people make sense of it. That's great. It's really interesting. As you said, something that's typically the domain of others being brought into the realm of and psychology. And you spoke there very briefly about how difficult it is sometimes to talk across um, disciplines. And uh, in my own experience, it's been the case that policymakers are very willing to listen to the economists. But when the a psychologist shows up, the, the door's closed in your face. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I do think that is changing slowly. Um, and I think that the government and, and other people are more willing to listen to psychologists because I think that pe when people hear psychologists they think clinical psychologists and they don't realize the breadth of areas that we study but bringing this back to kind of the focus of the podcast uh, we're interested in how these things play out in the workplace so so what about inequality in the workplace and have you looked at this and kind of what are your thoughts on how this stuff plays out in that context yeah we haven't looked at it specifically within let's say a, a, take a specific workplace but we have looked at people's perceptions of health differences by occupational social class. So the UK, historically, measurements of socioeconomic health inequalities in the UK have pretty much been one and, one and the same as occupational social class differences. And that's historically what, where much of the focus has been. And we've got these really good measures of occupational um, social class, sometimes used as proxies of, for prestige and different kinds of work associated with is seen as more prestigious and many of the traditional effects you'll see in, in health outcomes are, are, are mapped against that and what we did recently is ask people in the UK using nationally representative samples and the and the US sample as well where there's this less emphasis on these occupational social class differences whether they're aware that people in professional kind of class or managerial or higher management positions will live longer um, statistically speaking, than people in, let's say, unskilled work or routine work. And what we found was that the uh, UK population, on average, was pretty much aware of this. They were pretty accurate. There were some, what you might expect, people who are more politically engaged. Some voting preferences as well predict their awareness of that. 
and a little bit like you see in 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 the economics literature as well what you find is that people who vote more conservative underestimate these differences and people who vote more like say liberal in america but labor in the uk overestimate them so actually think they're worse than they than they are we compared them to data from about 10 years ago so we could make an objective observation about how accurate people were and then we what we find in america is there's much less awareness of that as a population level and also there's much more tolerance for inequality on the basis of differences in, in how, uh, occupational prestige if you will so more american american in our sample were likely to say that there should be they they were asked to say what they think the average life expectancy of a professional manager should be and what somebody who works in in more routine occupations should be and we found that they were more likely to say differences than our U uk population so there's, there's that kind of tolerance for inequality in the us extends to, to health at least in our data so super interesting work, and obviously it does spill over into the workplace. So what is uh, next for you? What's coming up? So two related things. I'm really interested in how people conceptualize non-medical health factors, so social determinants for want of a better word. So how do people think about income or education, occupation, ethnicity, gender, and how they impact on health? And how do they how do they appraise them and then how does that determine wh what they think is most important and what can be changed and how they can help other people and i'm particularly interested in that because i'm working on a project where we're talking to primary care workers mainly gps I hope, i'm hoping to speak to some social prescribers as well about how they talk about non-medical factors in consultations does it come up do they bring it up do patients bring it up how do patients respond when it's brought up and how do people understand how it impacts on their health and what you see is so what we're finding so far is that um, time pressures in the consultation really make this difficult but it's it it is coming up and figuring out better ways to help measure those things and think about that kind of pipeline of of helping people where you can signpost them to that will be effective that feels effective for both both the patient and the clinician is really important and I'm, i want to think more about those models of how people make sense of that in in those settings and generally and on the flip side we're also working on a project also in primary care thinking about because we know that that burnout and stress and overload is particularly acute in these frontline services it's basically as many of the people have been talking to it's the front line it's the, the, the kind of coal face where most people come into contact with professional state supported services, right? Primary care. And one of the things that's been implemented this year is part of the quality outcomes framework, which is how they fund primary care, has now got a new, a new expectation or requirement that primary care practices and networks focus on the well being of, of the people who work there clinicians and and support staff and we are talking to people and how they're responding to that new requirement what kind of things that they want to put in place how are they going to measure it how have they selected interventions and there's quite a lot of i suppose there's a kind of vacuum of actual advice so it's how people kind of make sense of that there's an expectation there is funding associated funding associated with addressing these things how do people kind of navigate that space so we're really interested in figuring that out as well that's super interesting, and it reminds me of our very first episode on this podcast where we spoke to Laura Byrne, who was talking about the design of well-being policy and what she referred to as well-being washing, which is across different organizations now there's a motivation to put in pay place these well-being policies. Um, but oftentimes the, the, the staff or the lower-level employees are completely unaware that they exist. Um, in this case, there's obviously a great need for it because these folks are experiencing burnout but their interpretation of it and how they engage with it or not is really important to understand because obviously we need these people to stay in post because they're the the thing that keeps people healthy and in some cases alive but they obviously need to get, take care of themselves as well so that sounds really really interesting my final question then is uh to wrap up and you can pick uh, either of these two to answer or you can answer both if you prefer do you have any advice for students who want to get into the kind of work that you do now? 
or the other question is do you uh, if you could go back in time uh, uh, would you give any advice to your younger self i think yeah i picked the second one but I, I suppose it kind of bleeds into the first one as well and it's probably about being authentic to what interests you so i spent a lot of time like i said before working in stuff that i don't necessarily apply now and that was that was time well spent and i think i learned a lot about building on other people's work but i would if i could do anything i would probably advise myself to take take the leap earlier into things that really get me excited and enthused because it makes things easier in the sense that it, the motivation is just stronger and it it becomes easier and more self of it kind of you know that kind of virtuous cycle you talk to people who you're more interested in enthused when you talk to people and they kind of reciprocate that and it just becomes easier to make kind of long lasting collaborations as well. And I think research can be lonely. And if you find people who are just as buzzed about something as you are, it really helps for those days when when you're not as buzzed, but someone else is kind of holding it, holding that burden with you. Dr. Emma Bridger is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Leicester. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Simon. It's been lovely to be here.